This morning I'm going to talk about optimization in CUDA. And um, we actually have quite a lot of time. Well, we have an hour and 15 minutes for this session, and then there's a 45-minute session that Dave's going to do. But if we go over and need to extend the optimization to the second session, um, we can do that. So I'm going to try to go slow because this is important stuff. Um, and feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, I don't know, maybe we have the handheld mic we can pass around or something. I'm not sure. But um, so to get started, um, you know, as you saw yesterday, uh, CUDA is a fast and efficient way to program GPUs and to access the massive parallelism that um, the GPUs have. Um, and unlike um, GPGPU through graphics APIs, it allows direct execution of data parallel programs without the overhead of, of those other APIs. Um, and if you use CUDA on test load GPUs or any of our other GPUs, you can usually get pretty good speed ups uh, over c CPUs um, on data parallel computations right out of the box. Um, but if you, can, if you know a little bit about optimization principles in CUDA, then even higher speed ups are achievable. So that's what I'm going to cover in this, this presentation. Um, and I'm basically general performance guidelines, some pitfalls, and then strategies for optimization. So here's an outline of this presentation. Um, first, I'm going to give general optimization guide, guidance, talk about the kind of, kind of major points um, in CUDA, especially on the current uh, hardware. Um, and then I'll give two um, programming examples. Uh, one is matrix transpose, and I'll talk about how to um, get best performance on that. And then I'll do a more detailed uh, multi-step optimization kind of tour of uh, parallel reductions. Um, one thing that you didn't get in the introduction to CUDA that we usually present is you saw some very basic code examples, but usually we do a little bit more with like a matrix multiply example. So I apologize that you haven't seen that yet, and I'm going to dive into more code. But um, since a lot of you have already programmed in CUDA, hopefully that will be OK. Um, OK, so before I start, I'll do a quick terminology review just to make sure that everybody remembers what you learned yesterday. Yeah? We could, we could probably, I could take up the matrix multiply example if you wanted to do that. Um, like while you're, if you think it's worthwhile. I think well, I'd rather not okay. because of just switching gears would be okay. too difficult. But um, Okay, so uh, terminology review. So a thread is concurrent code and it's associated state that's executed on the CUDA device. Uh, in parallel with other threads, many other threads. Threads are the unit of parallelism in CUDA, um, but you should be aware of the difference between CPU threads and GPU threads. Uh, CPU, GPU threads have much lower creation cost because, and l lower resource usage, and the switching between them is smaller. And this is all because basically we launch thousands of them at once, and therefore all those costs are amortized over many threads. Um, a warp is a group of threads that are executed physically in parallel on the GPU um, in SIMD fashion, which means that they are basically within a warp. Every thread is executing the same instru instruction. On our current GPUs, the warp size is 32 threads. Um, but in terms of optimization, another the term half warp will come up, which refers to the first or second 16 threads in the warp. Um, the reason that comes up is just because of the way the, uh, the memory interface is built. Um, a thread block is a group of threads that are executed together um, on a multiprocessor, and they're tied to that multiprocessor so that they're able to share data between themselves uh, in the shared memory. A grid is a group of thread blocks that execute a single pro program logically in parallel, but not actually concurrently. Um, and uh, the device refers to the GPU, whereas host refers to the CPU. And sometimes we'll use the abbreviation SM to mean multiprocessor. It actually stands for streaming multiprocessor. Um, another abbreviation that sometimes comes up is in thread blocks. We sometimes call CTAs, which stands for Cooperative Thread Array. And that, uh, I think, is a more descriptive name because it refers to the fact that threads can cooperate by sharing data and synchronizing with barrier synchronization. OK, so first I'll talk at a high level about these four optimization strategies. Um, the first and probably the most important for programming any parallel machine is to optimize algorithms for the GPU. Um, the second 
is to optimize memory access coherence. The third is to take advantage of the on-chip shared memory. And fourth is to use parallelism efficiently. So in more detail, um, when you optimize algorithms for the GPU, you want to do it in a way that maximizes the amount of independent parallelism. So basically, you have many data elements that can be processed independ independently by many threads, because that's the best way to utilize all of the, um, all of the GPU. You want to maximize the arithmetic intensity. That's the ratio of math or arithmetic instructions to bandwidth. So um, if sometimes if you're bandwidth bound, um, it makes sense to do a more complex computation as long as it doesn't increase the amount of data that you need. Um, for example, higher order um, uh, expansions uh, for, for iterative solvers and things like that it makes sense sometimes. Um, Sometimes it's better to recompute than to cache. Um, the GPU spends most of its transistors. Um, you know, with Moore's law, we get more transistors every year, and we usually we try to apply those as much as possible to ALUs and other um, um, computational units rather than to memory on the chip. Um, we do have memory on the chip, obviously, but uh, we try to use it very economically. So it's um, if if you can recompute the data easily. Sometimes that's better than storing it. Um, and then also move more computation onto the GPU to reduce the amount of communication back and forth between the host and the CPU and the GPU. Um, so even low parallelism computations, if they're not the main um, part of your uh, whole application, can slow you down if, it, if they require transfer back to the CPU. And so even though they might, be the, might not be the most efficient code to run on the GPU, it might be better to run them there um, rather than transfer data back and forth multiple times. Um, optimizing memory coherence. So there's a concept in our architecture that we call coalescing of memory accesses. So as you know, we run threads together in a warp. And, um, and you can get best throughput from the memory if you do larger transfers. So what we do is we try to gang together the loads and stores for a whole warp of threads into a single memory transaction. And there are rules um, for when, and we can, when we can and cannot do that ganging together. Um, the, the thing to realize is that if you cannot um, coalesce the memory accesses, then it results in basically as many transactions as there are threads in the, in the warp, or half warp, actually, on G80. Um, and so the, that can mean an order of magnitude of, of Difference in performance if you're if you're bandwidth bound, With, and most computations are at least partially bandwidth bound. Um, so I'll go into the rules in detail in a bit, but um, you, the basic idea is that you want to optimize for spatial locality. Try to do sequential accesses across your warps if possible. Um, uh, if you're using texture memory, if you're using the texture uh, data types, then you want to optimize for spatial locality because the texture unit does have a cache and it's optimized for two-dimensional spatial locality, which means that threads in a warp should access air, um, texels that are close together in, in two dimensions. How do you know that the Well, you can see the addresses that, so you know how the addresses for each thread are computed, and so you could, so should be able to. In your addresses, you not in the hardware addresses. Yes, exactly. Uh, the question was, how do we know if that's the case? and um, so the, the answer is that you can tell from the, your, your addresses that you pass to the texture lookups. So as, if your addresses are close together in two dimensions, then they should uh, result in cache hits. Um, doesn't those three dimensions, texture memory doesn't understand three dimensions? Um, it does. It, uh, so if you're using 3D textures, which are not yet available in CUDA, then you should also be able to get better caching by keeping your accesses spatially local in three dimensions also. Um, if you're using shared memory, um, I'll talk about this in more detail, but you want to avoid high degree bank conflicts. Uh, I'll just put that out there, That's just, uh, but I'll go into detail in a few slides. Um, okay, the next optimization strategy is to take advantage of shared memory. Um, this is probably the most important new architectural feature that um, CUDA enabled GPUs have that previous GPUs did not. Um, basically, 
shared memory is kind of, it's a register file, basically a globally addressable register file, so it's hundreds of times faster than op chip memory. Um, and also threads can cooperate, so they can share data, so you can um, reduce the amount of, um, of loads from global memory. So there are a couple of times this will come up. You'll see one example in the transpose um, optimization example later. But sometimes you can use one or a few threads uh, to load or compute data that's shared by all the threads. Um, so for example, if you, if you just have a single condition um, for some branch that all the threads will have it the same, then sometimes it makes sense to just compute that with one thread in the, in the warp or in the block and store it in shared memory and then synchronize and then all the threads can, can read it. Um, you can use it to, this, sorry, this is the example that's in the transpose example. You can use shared memory to avoid non-coalesced accesses. So you, so you can use it as sort of a staging area between loads and stores. Even if you're not sharing the data, if the load or store wouldn't have been coalescible, sometimes you can read linear addresses into shared memory so it's coalesced and then do the non-linear accessing uh, from shared memory so that you don't pay the cost of a non-coalesced load or store. Uh, and then the, uh, sorry. From block, uh, block level uh, synchronization process. Uh, sorry, what's the question? Well, if you uh, want to do something like that, mm -hmm. that you want to, uh, you might want to say, okay, uh, on the block level synchronization, that all the threads Mm -hmm. and then have the thread run. Yes, of course. If, if you do that, if you, if you load into shared memory first and then have, if any thread accesses um, memory that it didn't load into the shared memory itself, then you have to use a, a block synchronization, a sync threads uh, call in order to make sure that the data that each thread needs is actually there before it tries to read it. That's a global sync, right? No. There's across blocks. It's a global sync across a single thread block, but it's not, it doesn't extend beyond thread blocks. We don't have synchronization across thread blocks. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the synchronization is lightweight. I, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, okay, so the, the fourth strategy is to use parallelism efficiently. Basically, this just means do whatever you can to make sure that you have enough work to keep the GPU busy. Um, so that means partition your computation into blocks so that you can spread it across all the multiprocessors. Um, have those blocks, have as many of those blocks as you can, um, and have many threads total. And there's also some strategies and heuristics I'll talk about later for figuring out how to size those blocks so that you um, are able to run multiple blocks per multiprocessor to hide latency as well, and um, et cetera. So, uh, and then, yeah, that's key, you want to keep the resource usage low enough per block so that you can have multiple active thread blocks per multiprocessor. And those resources that are shared across blocks would be the registers and the shared memory, basically the, the multiprocessor resources. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go into more detail about global memory reads and writes and coalescing and the performance characteristics there. So global loads and stores are the highest latency instructions because they have to go off chip to wait for, for their, their results. Um, and they take approximately, for the entire warp, they take 400, 600 clock cycles on a, a GeForce 8800, for example, a G80 G GPU or a Tesla. Um, so because these are such high latency, they're likely to be a performance bottleneck, especially if you're not careful with the way you write the code. And so therefore, optimizations can greatly increase your performance. Um, in the examples I'll show, you can get up to 10x speed up just by making sure that your accesses are coalesced. So what is coalescing? So coalescing is a coordinated read by a half warp, or actually, in general, you should probably just think of it as a coordinated read by a warp, because in future architectures, we won't have half warps. It'll just be the warp size is 32, and um, so you, you won't want to go below the warp size, basically, for any optimization. But a, it's a coordinated read by a warp of a contiguous region of global memory, and those contiguous regions are either 64 bytes, 128 bytes, or 256 bytes. So for example, if you were reading one word or per float, say an int or a f uh, per thread, say an int or a float, then that would be 64 bytes for 16 threads. Um, if you're reading an int to or a float to, 
or an int 4 or a float 4, then it would be 128 bytes or 256 bytes. Um, now, there are restrictions on the G8X architecture to the addresses across all the threads that are doing a co uh, coherent read or, st or store. Uh, and those restrictions are that, one, the starting address for the region, that 64 bytes, 128 bytes, or 256 bytes, must be a multiple of the region size. In other words, it has to be aligned. So if you're reading one float per thread, then you basically have to make sure that you're, the address of the first float that you're reading for that warp is aligned to 64 bytes. So it's a multiple of 64 bytes. Um, and then the case thread in a half warp must access the case element. So that just means that the threads have to access sequential addresses. Um, there is one exception to this. As long as the addresses within a warp um, obey these rules, not all threads have to participate. And this is because the instruction set has the ability to predicate results. So instead of doing a branch, you can, um, we can apply what's called a condition code to instructions. And co um, instructions that have false conditions uh, don't write their output. So they perform the instruction. The thread performs the instruction, but the output isn't updated. And so we can use that to have some threads not do a load or a store, but we still get a coalesced memory transaction. Um, and the question will probably come up, how do, we, how do you write code that does that? Well, basically, if you have a very short branch around your load, or if you use the ternary operator, for example, the question mark colon, um, then usually that will get compiled to predicated instructions rather than true you know, if-then-else uh, instructions. Yes? Do you have a directive to force alignment? Um, so, yeah, the question is, do we have a directive to force alignment? Whenever you use CUDA malloc, it's, every CUDA malloc is allocated to be 256 byte aligned, so that no matter how you read from that, as long as your addresses satisfy these conditions within a warp, then you're assured of it being aligned. If you, there's another thing. If you allocate two-dimensional arrays, we have a, a function called CUDA malloc pitch, and pitch refers to the basically the stride in bytes between rows in, in a two-dimensional array. And so Kudamala pitch allows you to re request a 2D array of a certain width in bytes, and it'll actually pad that so that each, each um, row is aligned, and it'll return to you the pitch, which you can then cop pass to a function called copy 2 d so that it knows how to copy into that. Um, but um, in your actual kernel code, you don't usually have to worry about the pitch. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. Sure. Thinking, looking at those different floats, what you're saying about the alignment, does that mean that float three is probably best avoided? Yeah, I'll talk about that actually. Um, so the question is, because of that alignment, does that mean that types like float three are best avoided? Um, for global stores and loads, yes, float threes are float threes are best avoided, and I'll talk to that a little bit in a couple of slides. Um, and also user types that aren't a multiple of, you know, the aligned size or the memory access sizes. Okay, so now a pictorial example of this because I know that seems confusing, but really it's pretty simple. Um, here's an example of coalesced access. So basically all threads in the top are reading and so there's 16 threads and the starting address is 28 bytes. So that means that they're each reading um, one float and so that's 64 byte aligned, and so, and then each thread reads, you know, the next float. So it's four bytes between them. So that's a, you're sure that's going to be coalesced, and that's a pretty, a pretty common case actually. So it's good. The same would happen with ints. Um, and here's an example where it's the same addresses, but some of these threads have evaluated some condition that caused them not to actually execute the load. So what happens is that just gets predicated, and lo the load executes. It's just they don't write anything into a register. Um, if, so the question is, if you didn't have any empty threads, if instead these threads did something else, you said to modify C3? Or? Can, I, can I make a little uh, for loop or something so that it executed thread 0, thread 3, thread 4, and so forth? Oh, yes. 
So um, basically, all threads would need to compute the address that they would need for coalesce access in order to um, assure that you get coalescing, even if some of the threads don't participate. So if you did something like compute addresses so that the even threads got sequential or addresses like that, but the odd threads got something different, then that probably wouldn't end up being coalesced. Right. So the question is, let's say that these 16 threads do access bytes, you know, 128 through 191, but they're permuted. And that's the next slide. Um, sorry, that's misaligned. Oh, no, yeah, this here at the top is permuted. So here you can see two threads. They still access the same region, but these two threads are, in, are switched. That is not coalesced on G80. This is something that's going, going to get better in future architectures. We realize that this is a steep cliff that you can fall off of, so we're trying to make it better in, in future chips. Um, but right now, you want to be careful with that. And, and this is a case where sometimes it makes sense to read them sequentially into shared memory and then permute your access. And I'll talk about that. Um, and this is, down here is an example of threads that are accessing sequential addresses, but they're misaligned. So the first thread, they're shifted over, so this thread's accessing from a non-64 byte aligned address and these, this would not be um, coalesced. This is also a case that's going to get better in the future. Now, and of, of course, there are cases that won't get better in the future. For example, if these threads are striding more than 128 bytes each, and that will come up in the transpose example, and I'll talk about how to, how to avoid that. Um, okay, so uh, we did some timing results on a simple, you know, trivial code just, just written to compare coalesced access to non-coalesced access, and you can really see the difference here. So in this case, the kernel, all it does is each thread reads a float, increments it, and writes it back. So it's doing two memory transactions. It's reading, there's three million floats, um, and the times are averaged over 10,000 runs to make sure we get rid of noise. And so we divide that into 12,000 blocks of 256 um, threads each, and if we are doing perfectly aligned and sequential addresses, it takes 356 microseconds. Um, if we, you know, we modified the code also so that there's a condition in there so that all the threads compute these sequential aligned addresses, but some of the threads don't actually do the load, and so they don't participate. And that's basically the same performance, slight overhead for the extra instructions. Um, but if you permute or misalign the thread axis, it's about 10 times slower. So that's why this is such an important optimization target. Um, this is usually the first thing I look for when I'm optimizing CUDA code. So, um, and now here's the float three example uh, that someone asked about. So, here's a kernel called access float three that takes in a pointer to an array of float threes, um, and I think that should be a pointer to an array of float threes for output, and each thread computes its global index within the array, which is basically its block ID times the block dimension plus its thread ID within the block. And then it reads a float three. It increments each of the elements of the float three and then writes it out. So what's going to happen with that? Well, it's going to, float three is 12 bytes. Um, so it can't be, it's not a multiple of 64 bytes, 128 bytes, or 64 bytes for a whole half warp of accesses. So this is going to be divided into three float accesses. And what it means is that first all these red ones are going to be red. So T0, T1, T2, T3 will all access these red cells. And then there'll be another load instruction that accesses the green ones and then one for the blue ones. Um, and so you can see that the stride between these is um, 12 bytes. And so that's not going to be, um, it's not sequential uh, words, so it won't be coalesced. Um, so what can we do to fix that? Um, feel free to stop me, by the way. I feel like I'm going fast. Um, okay, so here's at the top we have global memory, and then we have shared memory. Um, and here what we do is instead of having threads stride across all the red ones and then the green ones, we write the code so that T0, T1, T2 read sequential words, and they read them into shared memory, 
And, then, and so that's going to read, read um, one third of the data, since it's float tree data. And then you shift up and you have them read the next, say, 256 uh, words. And then you do it one more time to get the rest. And um, so then, in this case, since they're 256 thread blocks, it's going to, um, the offset will be 512. Wait, I guess, yeah, it'll be 256 first and then 512 the next time. Um, and that's the offset in, in the index to the array, not the offset in bytes. Um, so, actually, the way this is implemented, I think, yeah, we have the code coming up, but the basic idea is that you cast it to an array of floats and do the read into shared memory and then access the shared memory as an array of float threes. Um, okay, so we need... Um, an array in shared memory that's the, basically the number of threads per block times the size of a float three, obviously. And each thread is going to read three scalar floats. But instead of reading three floats that are contiguous for each thread, you're reading them basically one block away um, each time. And um, so each thread retrieves this float three into shared memory, casts the float star to a float three star, and then use the thread ID as the index to access that, and the rest of the code doesn't change. So original kernel code, you remember, all, the main goal was to just increment each element of a float three uh, in the array, obviously trivial, but, um, and so in this case, it seems to just drastically inflate the code, but if you were doing some real computation, that would probably be the majority of the code, and this would just be a few lines extra. So, but here's how we do it. Um, at the top, maybe I'll just, i use the old-fashioned pointer. Um, we have, we compute our index as before, but then, and then we have an array in shared memory of float, a float array of 256 times three floats instead of just 256 float threes. And then our input and output arrays we also have as floats. You can also do this by leaving this as float threes and then casting to a float pointer before reading from it. Um, so then we just do the three loads. So we read, each thread reads its index into the first 256 words. Um, then it reads its index plus 256, and then its index plus 512, and then you synchronize because now instead of each thread loading its own data, each thread is loading data that some other thread is going to use. So we need to synchronize to make sure that we're done with all the loads in the shared memory. Um, and then we cast this back to a float three, and we can read our own value from the, just using our thread index into a float three array. Okay, any questions? You have a question? So it seems like I can get rid of sync rate if I just A float four. Yes, that's another way to do it. If you want to do a float four load per thread, um, that's another way to do it because that'll, that's coalescible, and um, that means that you don't have to do the sync threads. So um, it's a trade-off. You, you know, you can either use less um, global memory, or, or you can use a little more global memory by doing float fours, um, or you can. Um, do float three. So this comes up probably more often. Most people will just say, oh, I'll just use float fours and some float threes. But if you have a user type that's maybe two floats and an int or something like that, um, then, you, you know, sometimes this, it's just an important technique to know about. Yeah. Um, would float fours be faster this than this code because they can read 256 bytes? I would experiment. Um, Theoretically, they should be faster. I think there's actually a performance bug in G80, for example. That means that the bandwidth of float fours is slightly less than um, float ones, I think, than four float ones. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where they fall. I, I can't remember. But um, and also, this is you know more instructions. So so yeah, theoretically, it should be faster to just do float fours. And so this is the artificial example, but it's intended to. Um, show how that if your data, if you have some user-defined struct or something that's not aligned, you can change your code so that you make sure you get the best throughput from memory. Um, so then the, the, the end is basically the reverse of what we did before. We just cast, um, cast the array to a, a flow three, write it back into shared memory, synchronize, and then we do the three stores. Any other questions on this? All right, um, okay, so this is more information about basically user-defined structures that are not um, four, eight, or 16 bytes each. 
um, or some multiple of 4, 8, or 16 bytes. So um, in, in general, for par data parallel programming, it's uh, valuable to use uh, structures of arrays, at least for your global memory arrays, instead of array of structures. So in other words, define some structure that has a float, a float, an int, and a, and a you know, char. Um, it's probably better to have a structure that has an array of floats, array of floats, array of ints, and an array of char, rather than a struct that has one of each and then an array of that struct. Um, and because if you do that, then you can be sure that, other than the, the chars, which are smaller than four, um, four bytes per thread, uh, then you're, you're sure to align it. If you can't do structure of arrays, then when you define your structure, there's actually, we have an intrinsic um, for the, uh, called align, where you can tell it to align to 4, 8, or 16, which will cause each struct to be aligned within the array with possible loss of, or waste of storage. Um, and then use shared memory to achieve coalescing. There's an example of this align. I'm not going to go into detail. There's an aligned types sample in the SDK uh, where you can see more detail on this. Yeah. When you say a, a structure of arrays, do you mean that each array can point to a whole different place of memory? Or that the array, that the data within a structure should be an array that's stored in memory? Um, the, the Well, so the idea is Maybe I should use a chalkboard. Um, I think it's too dark. Thank you. Um, the idea is norm you would have had some structure with some non-aligned amount of data in it, and you wanted to have an array of those. So each thread would have it get the structure. Instead, you kind of split that into one array per data element in the structure. But those data arrays don't need to be continuous. Across the data arrays, they don't. But the data across threads needs to be contiguous. Yeah, so whenever you're thinking about um, whether accesses are sequential or not, you want to think horizontally across the threads in a warp rather than across the loads within a thread, right? So when you're loading each element of a, for each, for each thread, if you're loading each element of a structure, um, it doesn't matter that for each thread that the, the data for each of the elements of that structure are in completely different parts of memory because they're not going to be read in parallel. They're going to be it's going to be read in parallel across threads, and then you'll move to the next data element to load and read that across threads, et cetera. Does that make sense? It could, yes. Um, so if your data type was... Right, except that if those data elements in the structure are different types, then the compiler is going to split those into separate loads um, unless you cast the structure to a, you know, just a float pointer or something. Do you see what I'm saying? You, yeah, can we turn the lights on so I can use the chalkboard? You could turn it into a byte array, but it may, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. You can make your code more complex like that if you want. Um, uh, well, I don't think it can because, I mean, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I won't get into the reasons why or why it doesn't do it, but it doesn't do it. And most C compilers won't do that. If you load a structure that's got different types in it, and it's going to do multiple loads from memory. So, um, okay, well, I don't need the lights now, I think, so. Um, sorry. Okay, um, all right, so here's, here's the timing results. We modified the previous kernel, so instead of um, floats, we're doing three, uh, yeah, float, we compare with float three. So these are the same results that I showed before. This is just extending that slide. We're still doing 12 me megabytes of data, but it's 1 million float threes that we want to load. And so if we just lo load 1 million float threes, it takes, um, again, 3.2 milliseconds. And if we use shared memory as a staging area to coalesce those, then we get 10 times that performance. Okay. Um, okay, so to summarize that, this is a parallel machine, so we want to do everything we can to, to combine all of those parallel memory accesses so that we can maximize the throughput of the memory, um, which is slow because it's off chip, um, and we don't want to spend a lot of area on the chip for caching it. So um, this, is, this is critical for smaller memory-bound kernels. In most, most code that you write, you'll see that, oh, it's 
trivial to get these coalesce, and it, the, the natural way that I wrote it was. But if you do um, complex data structures, things like that, then you might want to think about using structures of arrays, for example, or cat maybe casting to an array of bytes and explicitly doing the load, um, as Eric said. Um, and I, I mentioned, I just talked about half warps, but in the future, there won't be half warps. It'll just be coalescing over the, the whole warp. So um, in general, if you just coalesce, if you just make your addressing so it coalesces over a whole warp, that'll work now and in the future. Um, and then I mentioned there's an align types CUDA SDK sample where you can um, uh, see examples of custom structures with using the align keyword. Okay, what about data transfers to and from the host across PCI Express? So um, obviously, map, you know, transfers across PCI Express are much lower bandwidth uh, than device memory loads and stores. Um, the bandwidth on, for example, a Quadro FX5600 is about 80 gigabytes per second to the device memory, but the PCI Express 16 lane port has a peak bandwidth of four gigabytes per second. So obviously you want to minimize the number of tra transfers. You can do that by grouping um, things. You can make sure that all your intermediate data is allocated and um, uh, initialized on the GPU rather than on the host and then transferred. Um, and, um, but there's another thing you can do um, to basically get the highest possible throughput, is, and that's to use what's called page-locked memory. So by default, and this is an OS thing, um, or this is a PCI Express thing, the PCI Express cannot DMA from um, pageable memory on, in system memory. And um, by default, when you use malloc in C, or uh, new in C++, then you get pageable memory. And uh, that means that it can be swapped out, out to disk. So um, what CUDA has to do when you do a CUDA mem copy is that it first has to do a mem copy on the host from, non -page or from pageable to non-pageable memory, and then it has to transfer across the PCI Express bus. And so then your performance is highly dependent on how fast it can do that mem copy. So that's chipset dependent, it's CPU speed dependent, et cetera. So what you can do is you can use a function we provide called kudamalloc host to allocate your host side array in page locked, or to make it page locked. Um, and when you do that, you eliminate that first mem copy. And so you can achieve, we, in practice, we see usually about 3.2 gigabytes per second out of the four peak. Um, and if you run on certain motherboards of ours, like the Enforce 680i based motherboards, which basically overclock the PCI Express bus, then um, we were pleased to find out. Actually, John Stone found this out and posted it on the forums before we even realized that, that we would get this in CUDA. But you, you actually get almost four gigabytes per second um, because the, Express, the bus is overclocked 25%, I think. Um, so, there, are, there is a caveat here. You should use this with caution because if you allocate too much page locked memory and you've got lots of applications running on your system, um, then it's not able to swap. It doesn't have much space in memory because you've got all this unswappable data there. Uh, and so you can actually you know, bring your system to, to its knees if you allocate too much. But, now, but if you have a fixed platform where you're only running the one application on it and you, know, you have more control over what applications are allocating memory, then you can probably push it a little bit farther. So the, the take home there is to test, um, test your system to, to learn its limits. Okay. Um, any questions on, on that, on PCI Express transfers? Yeah. Um, could you tell me about the speed of shared memory, uh, which is defined uh, as dynamic allocated e-commerce, right? Um, is that to the global memory? Um, shared memory is faster than global memory. Shared memory is always it's in the on-chip shared memory. Uh, I mean the shared memory uh, just defines the... X yes. So, so the question is, what about if you declare the X turn, which means it's dynamically, it's sized at kernel invocation time. It's the same thing. It's just using, it's still using the on-chip shared memory. That's just the way that CUDA exposes dynamically sized um, shared memory arrays. Is there a limitation of the uh, amount of shared memory? 16 kilobytes per multiprocessor. Yeah, it's the same shared memory. So, yeah. 
Yeah. That's a good point. On some motherboards, the second PCI Express slot goes through the south bridge instead of the north bridge or vice versa. I'm not sure which. And that can cut its bandwidth in half. Um, so some motherboards don't have that problem. So um, you can experiment with your motherboard. I, if, I, if I knew which ones ha ha don't have the problem, I'd tell you now, but I, I don't actually know. We do know internally, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can find out for you. We can put you in touch with the application engineers at at Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> I live in Virginia. Um, uh, at NVIDIA, who, who keep track of these things, which motherboards to buy, and which, you know, what are the good host workstations, and so forth. Uh, so, so if you're about to go buy machines and you have doubts about these kinds of things, we can we can help you out. And eventually, it's, uh, probably a contingent of this stuff will be yeah. and put on. I think, yeah, we're, we're going to have a website that has a lot of information for uh, system builders and stuff. Well, um, Again, I, I don't know a detailed answer to that. So. Motherboard. Yeah. The motherboard manufacturer, like some motherboard manufacturers cut costs yeah. by not putting electrically all eight lanes <coughs> in the second PCI. Right. Yeah, right. all 16, yeah. Right. right. Um, I wanted to ask you about the other talking of the PCI Express, because when I was looking for some motherboards, it was first about the there, and right now it's no longer. So yeah, so. So this feature, which was called Link Boost, um, on the N4680i motherboards is no longer a feature on our new motherboards. That doesn't mean that you can't overclock the PCI Express bus yourself. We just decided to make it user controlled because I think that, probably because they had stability problems on certain systems or thing, something like that. Um, I'm not sure. I think there are probably third party utilities. Some of the motherboard manufacturers provide utilities like ASUS for tuning your system. You know, they're, they're made for basically enthusiasts. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, so it's two questions. First is, can you talk about, is there a way to overlap I.O. and compute? And a related note to that is, um, is there a way to uh, replicate data across cards with SOI? Okay, two questions. The first question is, is can I talk about how to overlap data transfers with compute. Um, yeah, this is not a feature of CUDA 1.0, but in CUDA 1.1, there's a new API called Streams API, which allows you to tie certain transfers and kernel invocations to different streams, um, and uh, that allows that overlapping. Um, there's also some hardware dependencies there. So, for example, the G80 GPU um, doesn't allow you to overlap the transfers with, with uh, computation, on, but future GPUs do. I think G92 might allow one overlap, and you know, future GPU will allow two, so that eventually you'll be able to run um, the kernel while you're doing bi-directional transfers, and your CPU will be able to do, do something else, probably, so you'll be able to fully occupy your system. Um, and the second question was, is it possible to replicate data across multiple GPUs using SLI? Um, SLI is a graphics feature. It basically is specifically about dividing up a frame into multiple pieces and, spent, and rendering them on different GPUs. And that little connector that you see in SLI is actually a pixel bridge. It's only for compositing the final image. It doesn't do any of the main data transfers. So we don't have anything right now for duplicating data automatically across GPUs. Um, we, are, we do have plans to have peer-to-peer -peer transfers between GPUs. It's just we don't have it implemented yet. And so that would allow you to put data on one GPU or, or even just compute data on one GPU and then do a peer-to-peer -peer transfer without involving the hosts between them. And SLI does use that. Um, that's how it, uh, when there's dependencies between frames, for example, when it's doing rendering alternate frames on different GPUs, that's how it synchronizes the data. What does that stand for? SLI stands for Scalable Link Interface. Um, it originally was a 3D effects technology. From, there's a company we bought um, years ago called 3D Effects. And even more years ago, they had this technology called Scanline Interleave. And so they, they allowed you to buy two of their cards and render the scene by interleaving scan lines, which, if you think about it, is a really inefficient way to parallelize it because you get no cache reuse. 
Um, so, especially in the texture cache. So, um, we get much better performance by doing either split frame rendering, um, where each, frame, each GPU renders some load balanced portion of the frame, or um, alternate frame rendering, which actually usually performs better because um, then you don't have to duplicate the geometry transforms and stuff on each GPU. But um, that's more detail than you needed, probably. Um, OK, any more? Maybe it's worth making just a general comment that yeah. the philosophy behind CUDA is not to attempt to virtualize across GPUs. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it's a lower level. CUDA is exposing something lower level than that. And presumably middleware or the application itself using MPI or other things will, will be in charge of distributing computation and the data as necessary. I don't think CUDA, I don't think we're smart enough to build something that could figure out what your application really needs to do in terms of distributing the data and the computation. So we leave that up to you. Yeah, maybe I'll repeat that for the people on tape. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, CUDA is not attempting to virtualize uh, computation or data transfers to multiple GPUs automatically because it would be difficult for us to write a, build a system that can do that um, without knowledge of the specific applications. Um, so we're basically CUDA is fully interoperable with other platforms like MPI and um, potentially things like Charm++ at Illinois and OpenMP. In fact, we have a simple example coming out in the next release of the SDK of using OpenMP where you just have a CPU loop um, where each step of the loop is basically invoking a kernel on a different GPU and we just use OpenMP to, to do that automatically. Um, okay, so the next concept I want to talk about um, is occupancy. So this came up in Dave's talk, and I've talked about it a little bit, but it's basically occupancy is the number of warps running concurrently on a multiprocessor divided by the maximum number of warps that can run concurrently. So if you remember, Lars yesterday talked about the fact that each multiprocessor has 24 instruction counters. Um, so that means basically 24 warps can be resident on that multiprocessor at a time. And um, by having multiple warps active, that means then one warp, if, one, if the warps are from different thread blocks, if one warp is blocked, then you can swap in another warp from another thread block that's not uh, blocked and do some useful work while you're waiting on the memory, memory transaction. And so um, this first bullet point, what it says basically is that it's kind of like I talked about before, things happen in parallel across threads, not within a thread. And so um, thread instructions are executed sequentially um, but, and so therefore when you get blocked in that sequence of instructions, the only way to hide that latency and do useful work is to run other warps. And so that's why we have this um, principle of occupancy. So, so it's basically free. I mean, the, the question is, is that what's the cost of switching between warps? Um, it's, switching between warps is just how uh, the program proceeds because you execute an instruction, usually the next instruction is on a different warp or it's the same instruction on the next warp. And so we just do sort of round robin or uh, there's a couple of scheduling methods that, that the hardware supports, but um, there's, there's no cost to the switch. Um, switching, yeah, there's basically no cost to the switch between warps that are active on the multiprocessor. Um, now, you can minimize the dependency of performance on occupancy by minimizing latency in your code. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, um, but you should generally try to maximize occupancy by ma maximizing or optimizing the number of threads that run on each multiprocessor. And I'll, I'll talk in a bit of detail about this now. So I mentioned before that global memory accesses take 400 to 600 cycle, cycles. So you want to hide that latency in every way possible. Um, you can do that by having more threads. You can also do that by having a lot of independent mass, so mass that doesn't depend on all of the loads that are happening in that code that runs on the thread. So if, if you do a load and then there's some math instructions that don't need the results of that load right away, then they'll get executed right away. Um, and, um, and another idea there is don't do a sync threads after a load until you have to. If you have some other instructions that you can move before the sync threads, um, do that because the compiler usually assumes that you know where the sync threads should actually go. It can't really move the sync threads around. So, um, 
and then follow all the optimizations I talked about before about global memory. Um, register pressure. So register pressure is the, the, basically the register file is limited. It's shared by all the active threads on a multiprocessor. And so um, the number of registers basically limits the number of threads that you can run depending on the code. Um, so each SM has 8,192 words of register space, so 32 kilobytes. And um, each SM also has 16 kilobytes of shared memory, as I said. Um, and both of these are shared among all the concurrent blocks or threads that are running on the multiprocessor. So you can actually figure out how many registers are used by um, a kernel uh, and then figure out how many of those kernels you'd be able to run by dividing 8192 by that number of registers. And to figure that out, you can, um, you can look in the qbin file. If you pass dash qbin to mvcc, it'll generate this qbin file, which is basically the binary compiled um, code for the GPU. But it has a text header for each uh, kernel before the binary portion of the code. And so you can look in that to see the number of registers and the amount of statically allocated shared memory um, for each kernel. There's, I have a slide about that. You can also force the compiler to try to optimize register count. Um, so if it might have to churn longer and it might generate more code, but it, it, it might be able to reduce the, the amount of registers by setting a maximum. So you can pass dash max reg, pass dash max r reg count equals n uh, to MVCC, where n is the number, the desired maximum. You should know that at registers are allocated in fours, so n should be a multiple of four. Um, or and no, no matter what you set it to, it'll be a multiple of four uh, when it comes out. So, um, but you should also be aware that if you do this, not only can it take the compiler longer and potentially generate more code, but it, if it can't um, optimize to that number of registers, then it will use local memory. It'll spill those registers into local memory. And since local memory is basically the same speed as global memory, then that can slow you down. I've seen cases where that doesn't slow you down because you, the kernel was so um, had such a high arithmetic intensity, but um, it usually does slow down. And you can you can see LMEM usage in the in the uh, Qbin file also. Is there a question? Uh, yes. so, 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 I don't really understand this between local and global memory. Is, is that the same basic usage? Because okay. Name? Yeah, I guess this wasn't explained yesterday. Um, so the question is, what's the difference between local and global memory? The difference, they're physically in the same place. They're both on off-chip memory on the card. Um, but local memory has an address space that's local to a single thread. So this basically is scratch space for a thread. The only way you can get data into local memory is by storing it by a thread. The only way to get it out is, is by loading uh, from a thread. And usually it's created automatically by the compiler. Now, the nice thing about local memory compared to global memory is that since each thread always accesses some data element in its own local memory, as long as that data element is um, for 4, 8, or uh, 16 bytes, then you're in assured of coalescence across the warp. All right. So, did you have another question? So, from the point of view of, of memory uh, speed, uh, we should consider, we should, well, when, we say local, when you say local memory, we should think about global memory. Sorry. Yes. Wait. In terms of performance, local memory is the same as global memory. It's kind of confusing because it's called local, but that just means local address space to the thread, a scope versus um, physical location. Shared memory is on chip. And it's when you write a device function, is there a way to specify this should be local, this should be registered? There's no way to specify local memory, um, and I don't think registers either in your code. Um, we used to have that, but we decided that it was confusing to add all those different type specifiers to the language. So um, basically, if you, if you allocate an array um, that is local, that's not marked as shared, and it's bigger than like 16 bytes, then it's going to be in local memory. Because I get a whole bunch of single floats throughout my Then the, the compiler will try to put those in registers um, until it can't, it runs out of registers. Um, you don't. <laughs> That's true. In the PTX file, you can see which uh, you can look at. It's at the top in the header of the PTX. It says 
which values are in local memory. So it's not like you have to scan, go, part, you know, comb through the code, but changing it, yeah. So um, it's something that, is that in the 1.1? Is there a register keyword? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and it's longer than 16 bytes. Um, does that mean any access to that array is really not to the left? Then? Because all the different threads will have that much space. Yes. Space. Yeah, so if you have an array that's in local memory and it's not some multiple, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, if it's not 16 bytes. Does the compiler try to interleave the local memory space from different threads? I don't think it does. It'd be hard to do that. So, um, if you do have arrays, then yeah, you risk non coalesced local memory. Possibly, yeah. So all these questions about local memory, I get this a lot, and possibly it's, it's one of those things, that's why Dave tried to downplay it, I think. People get worried about this when they see this, especially if they haven't done a lot of CUDA con uh, coding. And it's not usually something that you worry about. It's one of the, um, you worry about global memory performance, um, worry about using the shared memory, but local memory doesn't come up as often. So um, Maybe I haven't written code enough to hit that, but I haven't. I think, it's, I think it does actually show up a lot if you are porting old code to CUDA. Okay. So. Okay, possibly, yeah. Um, Phil? So I'm just, uh, I was reading the slide, listening carefully, and then I got up some of my code and looked at the headers in some Cuban files, and I forgot in the meantime. What are the units in the 8,000, 8, Oh, this is 32-bit um, registers. So it's actually 32 types of register space. Okay. Um, 19, it's 19 four-byte registers. 19 registers yeah. Okay. Right, and then you multiply that times the number of threads in a block, and that's how many registers that block uses. Right. Um, that, that can sometimes help. If you use scoping in your code by putting curly braces around some block of code where you know, so that you know that a variable is local to that block, then the compiler can sometimes optimize register usage that way. So yeah, it's worth experimenting with that. Um, okay, so here's the, basically this is what happens, as Bill just found out, by looking in the Cuban file. Um, if, you, the, if you look in the code section for each um, kernel, you'll see the name of the kernel. You'll see how much per thread local memory is used. Often this will be zero. How much per thread shared memory. This is the shared memory that can be determined at compile time. And this is made up of parameters on the parameter list of the function, as well as some, all, every kernel uses, I think, 24 bytes or of, this is in bytes, of shared memory. And uh, that's for things like the, um, the thread index, or the block index and the block dimensions. Uh, uh, and the number of blocks are passed that way, for example. Um, and possibly, there might be some other things. I think it's like 24 bytes. Um, and then the number of registers used by the by that kernel. This is the number of sync threads, I think, the bar, the barriers, and then the binary code follows that. So do you have a tool that reads the Cuban file and just sort of uh, compiles and tells you what you're doing at a higher level than reading these Cuban files? So um, we're working on a profiler, um, a visual profiler. The other thing that in CUDA 1.1, there's a, another command line flag on the compiler that just has it spit out the number of registers. For example, that way you don't have to go dig into the cube in file. Um, yeah. Is there a situation where the number of registers is only dynamically dependent? I mean, in other words, it cannot be determined at compile time. No, the number of registers is always determined at compile time. Or local memory registers. So suppose you just declare an array which is dynamically allocated in the kernel. Is that possible? It's not possible to dynamically allocate device memory or either global or local in the kernel. So that no, that doesn't come up. Um, I lost, that was going to say something, but I forgot it. When you say per thread local, what are the units there? These are bytes. Bytes, these are registers. Okay. And the register is 32 bit, bits or four bytes. So. Um, okay, um, we do have a tool in the form of a spreadsheet called the CUDA Occupancy Calculator. If you go to the developer.nvidia.com slash CUDA, it's one of the links there. And this is, may look really confusing, but it basically uses all those limits that I talked about to calculate the number of thread blocks you can fit on a uh, multiprocessor. And so this can be 
sort of useful to get a, an intuition. So for example here, um, uh, you can see that we're saying, okay, I'm going to run 192 threads per block. And I know from my Qbin that each block uses 20 registers, and I know my shared block for a per shared memory per block is 68 bytes. And that was in the Qbin also. Now, if you do have a, a dynamic, if you do that X turn shared with the empty brackets and then pass the amount of shared memory on in the, the execution configuration, you need to add that in there too, because that's the amount of shared memory for, per block. And then it uses that to calculate basically the number of um, uh, threads you'll be able to have active for multiprocessors. So in this case, it's going to get two blocks. It's going to be able to fit two blocks, 384 threads, uh, which is 12 warps. And so that means since the, each multiprocessor can support up to 384 or 768 threads or 24 warps, then that's only 50% occupancy. Um, and times the number of, if you select the G80 GPU, which has 16 multiprocessors, then that's maximum of 32 simultaneous blocks on the GPU. And that's not bad because it has, there's 16 multiprocessors. We're going to have two blocks per multiprocessor, which means that when one's waiting on memory, you can do some work in the other one. So that's better than having only one or not even one per multiprocessor. Now, what these graphs show, these show you, this is the occupancy, so from zero to 24 warps, um, the warp occupancy. Um, if, what happens if I vary the number of threads per block? So you can see that actually for, with this number of threads or registers and shared memory, I'm never going to get above 50% occupancy. So I just want to make sure I pick a block size that at least gets 50% occupancy. Uh, and if, what happens if I vary the register count, if I'm able to get less? Well, you can see that as the register count goes down, the occupancy is going to go up. Um, and, and that's keeping the, the thread count at 192. And then there's this graph which says, what happens if I vary my shared memory usage? Well, it looks like I can use a lot more shared memory. I can use up to eight kilobytes of shared memory because there's only two blocks until it drops down to, um, to lower occupancy. Okay, so um, another thing to know is that given this, you can basically figure out, well, and you can do the back of the envelope, if there's 32 kilobytes of, of if there's 8192 registers, um, then in order to, to get 24 warps, the maximum registers I can use in a kernel is 10. So it, most complex code is going to use more than 10 registers. And so, I mean, just don't worry about it so much, but do, do be aware of it. Would it be better in general to write two kernels that basically are going to run sequentially into a 10 register? I mean, that, that changes a lot of other things. Yes. So how do I figure out? Your question is, would it be better to split a kernel that uses a lot of registers into multiple kernels? And um, it can be, um, you, you need to test. Um, basically, the, if, if the kernel is very short, so if, if you're not running a ton of blocks and the code is short, um, then basically you'll be dominated by the kernel launch overhead, which is something like 15 or 20 microseconds. So if your kernel is running you know, less than 100 microseconds for all of the blocks, then splitting into two kernels is probably going to, it could potentially slow you down, actually, right? So um, it's one of the it's another one of the things that you can experiment with. Um, okay. Um, all right. So related to occupancy, as you can see from the occupancy calculator, is how do I size my um, blocks and my grid? Well, you have a certain number of multiprocessors. You want to have at least one block per multiprocessor. So the basic rule should be the number of blocks um, should be greater than the number of multiprocessors. Um, at, or in other words, the ratio of blocks to multiprocessors should be greater than one. Um, and ideally, they should be greater than two, which I have down below, so that you can hide memory latency with multiple blocks on a multiprocessor. Um, so that means that your per block resources should be at most half of the total available. So each um, block should use 8K or less of shared memory and should use um, less than half of the of the available registers, and um, yeah. So now, if you want to scale to future devices, then ideally you want to have more than say 100 blocks. So that way, when we have when we double the number of micro multiprocessors or triple it or whatever, you know, you'll be able to scale to that. Um, <clears throat> 
and all of these things, like the number of multiprocessors, the number of registers, the number of shared memory, you can query them using the CUDA API. So that means you can write um, um, code that, um, that tunes itself or that scales um, itself. Okay. Um, also, it's a, you want to choose thread blocks that are a multiple of the warp size. So if you run, you don't want to run 50 threads. You want to run 32 or 64 threads, for example, um, because otherwise you're wasting threads because warps are SIMD. Um, so John Stone gave an example of padding um, that out to uh, even out the performance. Um, more threads per block is you can better hide memory latency, but more threads per block means fewer registers per thread. So there's a trade-off there, either more blocks or more threads per block. Um, some heuristics, usually a minimum of 64 threads per block is good, but only if you're going to be able to have multiple concurrent blocks. Um, it's better, usually in my experience, actually 128 usually works pretty well up to 256. When you get higher than 256, then you start to not have enough resources to run more than one block. Um, and of course, it all depends on your computation, so you need to experiment. Yeah, so if, I mean, we can't determine, we don't know how many threads you're going to run at compile time. So the compiler allocates so many registers. If you then try to run more threads times the number of registers per kernel, then you have registers, then it just doesn't run. It just fails out. When fail, does the whole program end? No, you get a, you get a CUDA error. You get a thread launch failed error. So my, so my program will just print thread launch error and only if you call CUDA get last error and then translate that error into a printf that says. <laughs> so no, it, it's it's robust. There's an error API. You can query that there's an error and and fail gracefully if you want. Or you can if you want you can just crash. <laughs> yeah. Should in principle CUDA runtime be able to tell uh, how what the maximum number of threads you can run? Um, Yes, in principle. Yeah, the question was, shouldn't the CUDA runtime be able to determine the maximum number of threads you can run for a kernel? Um, yeah, it could. Um, that's a good actual, it could, it might be a good feature for us to be able to query for after you load a kernel, how many threads that you could run max. Um, okay. Now, after talking all about occupancy, I, I want to stress that occupancy does not equal performance. You can write a lot of code that having low occupancy doesn't affect it that much, and that's because, for example, if it has really high arithmetic intensity and it has enough threads to keep, keep all 16 multiprocessors busy, then you don't really need to worry about um, occupancy. But uh, low occupancy multiprocessors processors can't adequately hide memory latency if you're, if you're bound by that latency. So it all comes down to arithmetic intensi intensity and the amount of available parallelism in your computation. So um, occupancy is a good thing to be aware of. It's not something that you should radically, um, you know, spend a lot of effort and changes in your code just to get occupancy to 100%, for example. And I, I would say that ideally you want to parameterize your application. How am I doing on time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, so we're, I'm going to go into the next session, definitely. So um, I have a lot more. Um, so parameterizing your application uh, can help you adapt to different GPUs. So you can query the number of multiprocessors. Um, uh, you can't query the memory bandwidth, but it's possible to, to know the memory bandwidth. Yeah, you can get the clock rate, but you can't get the bus width right now, so, um, but you can experiment. You can, um, you can uh, query the shared memory size, register file size, and the maximum number of threads you can launch per block. Um, and you can even make your app self-tuning. So for example, FFTW has an experiment mode where it will um, run a bunch of experiments and determine the optimal configuration for the present hardware. So if you wrote your hardware so that it queries all these things and then it runs some experiments and times them, um, then you can then you can make it self tuning and you can we even have an event uh, API coming up in the in CUDA 1.1 that allows you to time just the GPU time for example using the on chip timers so that you don't have software overhead in there. Um, I, I already had this slide. Uh, okay, so I'll talk about a little little bit about latency hiding. Um, so 
the hardware handles a lot of this for you. So you have this high memory latency from memory. Um, as long as you have more, a lot of threads um, and a lot of warps, then just by launching one load, for example, by the time you get to the end of, say, 256 threads, then the first load is almost, is almost back. And so you've almost hidden that latency just by having enough threads. And you can do even better by having multiple blocks because, for example, after this block gets all its data back, it can proceed while this one's still loading. Um, but you can also, but also the order of instructions can have an effect. Like if you do, um, if you're doing four sequential reads in a thread, then, you know, that might take 1600 cycles to hide that. Um, but if you, if you parallelize across the threads, then, then that, yeah, I guess that's automatic. I'm not sure why. I didn't write this slide. I'm, I apologize. Um, this, this late, what? It's, it's, you know, you might do a little bit of work between the three. Three yeah. Three where you show blocks that are subsequent to three. And so if, you, if your reads are all sequentialized like that based on some computation between the reads, it'll take a long time when you can do with the bottom one. Okay. So Lars explained it. Um, if you did, if you, in your code, you just had load this data, load this data, load this data, load this data, um, then this, even though you're hiding some of the latency with threads, if you don't have enough threads to hide it, then you basically would be waiting on these instructions. But if you can do load this data, do some computation with that data, then load this data, do some computation with it, et cetera, then, you know, all the threads doing this load and all the threads doing their computation on that load will probably much better hide that latency. And so um, you can uh, get better performance that way. Um, there's another type of latency. There's the mass arithmetic pipeline latency. Um, so basically the pipeline latency on G80 is 11 cycles. So if we do, for example, an add, then the result of that add can be used 11 cycles later in the same thread. And so if you don't have very many threads, um, then this read after write hazard can, can cause a stall. Um, so this is the example here where we use the F3 register, which is the result of the add immediately in the next add. Um, and here's an example of a shared data access where we load from the shared data and then into F3 and then we add immediately. And so how do we hide this latency? Well, have enough threads. And so you can actually compute that based on the 11 cycles. So um, to run, completely hide the latency, you want to have at least 192 threads per multiprocessor, not per block. Um, so that's six warps. So that, that translates to 25% occupancy. So if you have less than 25% occupancy, that's a time where you should probably optimize to get higher occupancy because you won't be able to adequately hide the uh, latency of the, of the pipeline itself. Yeah. So for that addition operation, uh, would it be better if you just said D equals Y plus Y plus B or something to that effect? So in other words, have, it, have the addition happen in one instruction? Well, yeah, in fact, in this case, yeah. no. Yeah, it's going to translate in the same ad. In this case, the compiler is actually going to tr probably translate this into a const, you know, a literal of eight. So it's probably a bad example. But um, uh, but the question is, should should we write this uh, this code as x equals y plus maybe it's a plus b uh, instead of x equals y plus a and z equals um, x plus b? Uh, it's going to get translated into the same code, same instructions, because we don't have a double mat, double add instruction, for example. Um, okay, what about the latency hiding of synchronization? Um, so thread synchronization, whenever you, a thread hits a barrier, then all the other threads in that block have to hit that barrier before you can proceed. So um, if you have a lot of threads, then that can, you know, be more latency. And so um, as I said, you want to make sure that you put your thread, sync threads where you want, where you need them and not have extra instructions after them that could be moved before them, for example. However, um, usually in practice, we haven't really seen a case where sync threads, um, that you bottleneck by sync threads, uh, as long as you don't use them excessively. Yeah, Bill? So I've been writing for thousands of processors in MPI for so many years. Yeah. The barrier is a huge pain. Man. Yeah. I can't imagine too many setups where I would need sync threads. Is the analogy there good, or am I falling into a trap? Um, I would I, sync threads is very lightweight. I wouldn't consider it to be something that you should avoid. Um, you need sync threads for correct code if threads are sharing data and shared memory. 
So if threads are all writing a value that other threads are going to read, then you need to synch synchronize. Otherwise, you know, the, warp, the last warp is not going to be done by the time the first warp starts reading. So, um, yeah, I, I think reasoning, I think reasoning sort of an, from an analogy of distributed computing across, you know, a widely yeah. separated processors is, is, will lead you into a mistake. Think of it more like you're programming on a connection machine or some super tired mad part, some super, super tightly coupled machine where, where these processes are in lockstep and are physically next to each other on the chip. Uh, that's probably a safer way to think about it because uh, you think of barrier as a big global synchronization across a cluster, you know, CD messages going back and forth. It's, it's, it's much, much lighter weight than that, dramatically so. It's, it's so lightweight. I mean, the architecture group considers this one clock cycle. Yeah. If it's not executing in one clock cycle, something's wrong. Then it sets per warp. So each warp pays one tick. Yeah, and so... That's it. Right, and so unless... But I mean, if, if you have a sync threads right after a memory access, then obviously you've got to wait for the memory accesses before those threads do their one tick barrier. So um, you want to have multiple blocks so that you can sw switch to another block that's not waiting, for example. Um, okay, so I'm over time, and I think this is a fairly good stopping point. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop now.